Good afternoon and welcome to the Tissue Regenics Group PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout the recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company can review all the questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Daniel Lee, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, and thank you to all the uh, uh, viewers. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, some time to spend with you and give you an update on Tissue Regenics interim 2024 results. We'll spend the, about the next 25 minutes discuss, uh, discussing the company, <clears throat> the activities, uh, some of our achievements, as well as our plans um, for the balance of the year, as well as uh, beyond. Uh, well, it's uh, certainly time for questions after the uh, presentation. So uh, this is the, uh, the disclosure <clears throat> slide that I encourage uh, everyone to review um, when you have the opportunity. Then as uh, intro introducing the speakers, uh, myself, I am Daniel Lee. I was appointed the Chief Executive Officer for Tissue Regenics in November of 2020. Uh, I originally joined Tissue Regenics Group as the President of U.S. Operations for the Cellrite Division in January of 2019. Personally, I've had uh, over 30 years of experience in technical as well as commercial roles within medical device as well as biologic uh, companies. Uh, some of these were startup companies. Uh, some of these were also very well established companies. And what drew me to tissue regenics uh, gets me, uh, you know, attracted me and 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 re, re, you know continues to keep me excited about the organization, is that we're in the space of regenerative medicine with tissue-based products. Uh, that are both allograft tissue, which is sourced from human tissue, as well as xenograft, which is sourced from animal tissue. Uh, very few companies around the globe have the capabilities of doing uh, doing both. So, uh, uh, David? Hey, good afternoon. I'm David Cock. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Tissue Regenics. Um, I joined the group in January of 2021, so uh, about three and a half years here now. Um, my background, I've got 30 years of experience in the medical device space. I started, ran, and then ultimately sold a contract uh, medical device manufacturing company. And along the way, I had the chance to work with uh, Danny for several years as a chief financial officer at Aperion Biologics. Um, I started my career on Wall Street, first in investment banking at Solomon Brothers, uh, then in corporate finance at GE Capital. And, you know, when I was doing my due diligence uh, on this role, when Danny called me in late 2020, you know, one of the things that really drew me to the company and, and, and appeared as a strong strength was the, our customer relationships. Uh, one that we talk about, um, and we'll talk more in, in, in this deck, is uh, Arthrex. And the fact that Arthrex, which is the uh, one of the world's largest sports medicine companies, a multi-billion dollar organization, chooses to work with Tissue Regenics and our cell right unit um, for its uh, premium demineralized bone matrix products. Um, that was pretty compelling because Arthrex can and does work with any company it chooses. And the fact that they saw the value in our technology in the bio rent segment uh, was pretty compelling. So. I'm excited uh, to talk to you all today about our first half results, and um, let's get into it, Danny. Sounds good. Uh, now, David and I will turn off our cameras during the presentation, but then uh, we'll, we'll see you again uh, for the Q&A. <clears throat> A little bit of an overview uh, of the company. Tissue Regenics is a global healthcare organization focused on in the area of regenerative medicine. Um, regenerative medicine is a specific discipline that seeks to regrow, replace, repair cells, organs, and tissues. Um, 
a lot, uh, many times it utilizes the body's innate ability to heal itself. At Tissue Regenics, we've developed tissue-based scaffold products, as I've mentioned previously, from human tissue as well as xenograft tissue. And these tissues are uh, utilize two core technology platforms, which both share the common objective of preserving the inherent biologic, biochemical, or biomechanical properties of the tissue through a gentle processing process, <clears throat> but then renders that, that tissue safe and sterile and uh, non-immunogenic. We have manufacturing uh, capabilities, uh, primarily in the United States for our allograft tissue, in the UK for our xenograft tissue, and in Germany where we produce um, ophthalmologic uh, tissue. We have an extensive product portfolio, uh, which is developed from numerous uh, tissue uh, platforms and addresses uh, diverse surgical markets. As David's already mentioned, we have some significant strategic partnerships, but then we also have some strong distributors in are in a number of our markets. We have kind of a, we have a hybrid commercial strategy where we have uh, strategic partnerships where we private label products, but then we also do distribute products uh, under the tissue regenics uh, um, labeling. The company is certainly well positioned to be a contributor in transforming healthcare through uh, regenerative medicine. So at this point, I'll let David walk us through some of the first half um, highlights um, in, from 2024. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, I'm excited that this is the second set of results that I get to go through the financial highlights and don't have to wait until the end to, to discuss our, our financial results. Um, you know, one of the strengths that we talk about uh, with tissue regenics is our uh, diversified revenue base you know uh, this set of results really highlights that um, historically our bio rinse division has been the fastest growing part of the business um, you know but as we face some headwinds in that segment this year or this um, our d cell division uh, delivered robust 34 percent growth um, and even within the you know, the, the bio rinse segment um, as we face regulatory headwinds in certain segments, we still had strong 26% growth in our core demineralized bone matrix business uh, and still posted solid double digit gains there. Just to, to run through the financial highlights, yeah, again, our revenues up 16% in the period. Um, our gross profit increased from 53% to 49%. And, if you look at the chart on the right, it may be a little bit difficult here, but this uh, um, this deck will be available in our website very soon if you want to look in more detail. But that shows the um, efficiencies that we've been able to generate and continue to increase with respect to our processing staff. And we look at the number of donors we process weighted by the resource time required, and then we compare that to the, the number of uh, full-time employees that we have. And you can see that trend continuing upwards, you know, and that shows through in the P&L with the 53% relative to 49, aided as well by some uh, favorable product mix. Our adjusted EBITDA profit, um, 1.1 million, you know, that compares in the entire of 2023, uh, not 0.9 million. So, um, more than doubled in the first half. Our cash position of 3.5 million supports our current uh, growth plans, including our expansion. Um, and you know we continue to do what we say we're going to do. The eighth consecutive reporting period of growth, seventh period of double digit half on half growth. So we're pleased with these results and um, expect this to continue next year or in the balance of this year. Danny? <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. So um, let's look at some of the commercial as as well as the operational highlights for, for our organization during the first half. Um, supply is, in our industry with human allograft tissue, supply is, you know, key to our growth. 
not only in having uh, donor tissue, but also the ability to process it, process it into finished goods. You know, th this is a, a, a key area. Uh, that's why it's one of our four S's, and I'll, dis I'll discuss that a little later at, during the presentation. But during the first half of 2024, we did see a 29% increase in the number of donors that we process in our San Antonio facility versus the same period in 2023. The graph in the bottom right uh, illustrates the year over year growth of all the donors we process through our San Antonio operation due to the expansion, due to additional efficiencies in process and scheduling. You can see how between 2019 through 2021, the numbers are fairly grouped tightly together, but you look at the advances we made in uh, in 23, uh, I mean, 23, as well as now in 24, those are, of course, the top two lines, how much we continue to expand our, our, our capabilities in terms of processing. As David uh, mentioned, during the first half, we, we enjoyed impressive uh, growth of our D-cell uh, products. Uh, this was seen not only in the product mix, but also that we, where we distributed 17% uh, more products, had more 17% uh, more shipments um, of our products, and we and a lot of this was also due to that we continue to add distributors for this direct distribution portion of our business. Our OrthoPure XT product, which is the only non-human <clears throat> product that we currently offer which is uh, used for certain anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction um, procedures. Uh, this business continues to grow as we added a new market in the first half of 2024. We added uh, Switzerland with our strategic partner Geislick. This is their, their home market. Um, Geislick, um, as you may recall, uh, is the distributor for this product in Italy. And due in part to the success seen in Italy, there was interest in adding on Switzerland. To secure our growth uh, for now and our future, uh, we purchased the building we have been leasing. Uh, this is the building that we occupied as part of our phase one and phase two expansion plans. Um, David will provide more, uh, more details of how this is uh, how this was advantageous. Uh, for the organization on a number of different fronts. And then later on in, the, in, in this deck, I will also discuss how the 4S strategy and our growth pillars uh, keep our organization on its positive growth trajectory. Little review of our product portfolio, which as we've mentioned is categorized into two processing technologies, bio rinse as well as D-cell. Uh, we process numerous uh, tissue te uh, tissue platforms. Uh, when we when we uh, talk about musculoskeletal tissue, we refer to bone as well as tendons. Uh, we talk about birth tissue. This is primarily amnion, and then uh, dermis, which is of course skin uh, skin tissue. But we use bio rinse on uh, to develop uh, to to process our, our bone pro our bone products. Our leading bone product is a as a product called Concentrate, a demineralized bone matrix product. It's distinguished in the marketplace by its ease of use, but more importantly, that it is a 100% bone product. And then every lot that we manufacture, we, we do a quality, uh, a quality control test to make sure that it demonstrates we, uh, osteoinductivity, that we make sure that it does grow bone. This is a very important feature for the product since uh, if you're using a surgeon is using this product in orthopedics, spine or trauma, they want to make sure that it does form bone. Another bio rinse product is our birth tissue products, which, uh, uh, which again, are utilized as proprietary processing method. Amnioworks is our leading product in this uh, area. Uh, this amniotic membrane is known for its aesthetics and has been used in ophthalmology, wound care, and other, uh, and other clinical indications. D-cell 
our other processing technology platform. This is a technology platform that came out of the University of Leeds. And it is known for its, this uh, process is known for its ability to remove 99% of the DNA from the, the tissue that undergoes the process. Our leading product in this, that utilizes this technology is Dermapure, a human dermis product. It too is distinguished by its uh, ease of use and, and handling, but more importantly, it's the performance of the product that that uh, that makes the difference. Uh, it is once it's implanted um, internally or externally, it's readily accepted uh, by the the uh, recipient, and then it incorporates into the surrounding tissue. So this is a very important characteristic, whether you're using this product in limb salvage, uh, wound care, urogynecology, or other or other clinical indication. <clears throat> with these products, we, you know, they, they certainly um, are utilized in a number of different, uh, different specialties. Independent market research certainly continues to confirm the growth of regenerative medicine. When we look at three of the surgical markets where we participate, bone grafting, skin substitutes, and soft tissue repair, uh, the market research shows that all of these are growing and our multi-billion opportunities. And if you see, if you note here, the growth rates that you're, you see in the industry, uh, that the products that are, um, that we have are growing in double digits. So, you know, we are growing, up, you know, above, above market. But very important for us is the opportunity <clears throat> to restore the quality of life for patients in numerous, you know, through um, products and numerous surgical specialties as we maximize the gift of uh, human tissue donation or through innovative non-human tissue products. Our, our organization will continue to be focused on the ongoing commercialization of our existing as well as new products in existing as well as new markets. Again, all designed to address unmet clinical needs. So since 2021, <clears throat> we've talked about the four S, the four S's, you know, which is really the foundation for our organic growth for the organization. And it's important that we make sure that this foundation was stable as, as well as sustainable. While we continue to find ways to improve, we now can build upon that foundation and focus on some tactical areas for our growth. One of those tactical areas is, of course, continuing to grow our base business. That's with our current products, line extensions, uh, with existing as well as new customers. Another growth pillar is our, uh, our tissue partnerships. We have developed partnerships with recovery agencies so that we've developed enough tissue supply for our needs, and then in and then when we can, when we have the opportunity, we can offer any excess inventory of tissue, can add value to that tissue, and we can provide that to other tissue processors uh, in the United States or around the globe. We're going to continue to look at market expansion. Market expansion for us means uh, means two things. We will broaden the use of our current products in addition, into additional surgical markets or specialties, but we're also going to broaden um, our mark uh, into markets outside the United States, which, and these are, these are markets, we certainly are targeting markets, which historically have not had access to human, uh, human or just tissue products in, in general. And the third growth, uh, fourth growth pillar for our organization is a regulatory evolution. <clears throat> we have used some of our resources to move our business into the medical device space. Why are we doing this? It gives us the opportunities to look at other products, uh, which are, are regulated as devices, and also gives us access to markets which regulate human tissue as 
uh, as, the, as devices. By doing this, we also put ourselves in a unique position. Many other tissue processors do not have uh, the, the, the capability of being a medical device manufacturer. <clears throat> so during the first half of 2024, you know, what are some of the things that we uh, had as goals? And obviously, what were some of the achievements with these growth pillars? Our base business, of course, our goal was to drive rev revenue opportunities and, 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 of course, ensuring that we had, a, had enough uh, human tissue products to meet the strong demand, as David's already mentioned, with our, our demin demineralized bone matrix products as well as our dermis products. And we continue to develop uh, efficiencies, so this way we can do more with what we, what we have. Through our execution, <clears throat> our D-cell business, uh, which is primarily a, a direct business, as David has already mentioned, has, that grew by 34% uh, year over year during the first half. Now, with respect to our demineralized bone matrix products, which grew at 26%, you know, one of our leading strategic partners, their, um, their forecasts and, and orders have grown by 87% versus the same period uh, last year. And we've been able to keep up with that um, by, you know, because of our ability to shift resources, not only from the donors, but also processing to those uh, areas uh, where products are in demand. How will we be doing on the tissue partnership uh, growth pillar? We added additional recovery agencies for our growth needs. And then for those tissues where we have a surplus, and to make sure that we honor the gift of tissue donation in a timely manner, we did sign new partners for our release uh, donor tissue, but opportunities to, um, to execute on those, on those plans. Uh, some of those were de delayed by the need for uh, regulatory approvals, which have taken uh, longer than, um, than anticipated. In terms of market expansion, <clears throat> In 2024, we began a dedicated effort to distribute allograft tissue outside the United States. And we announced in February that we, uh, that we have a strategic partner in Spain uh, for our human allograft tissue um, uh, products, uh, which is performing um, very nicely. Other markets are in process and pending uh, regulatory approvals. Now, with respect to regulatory evolution, as I mentioned, human tissue products are regulated differently around the globe. We have and are making changes we need to have to be a medical device uh, manufacturer, uh, have that have capability. This can open up new markets, new products, as well as, uh, as, well as give us the opportunity to make marketing claims about our, about our products. At this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to David, and he'll tell you a little bit more about the facility purchase, why it was advantageous, as well as uh, a review of our financial results. Hey, thank you, Danny. Um, you know, acquiring this building is really a concrete manifestation of the financial progress that we've made as, as a group. Um, we couldn't have done this deal uh, in January of 2021 when I started. Um, you know, I would talk to the commercial banks then and they said, you know, come back and see me when you're profitable. And, and well, in 2023, we were profitable. Um, so we got commercial bank financing, uh, which goes through very strict underwriting um, here in the United States. Um, and really wasn't available to us until we showed that profit. Um, so uh, this deal really allows us to own our future in buying the, the, the facility. It's a nice photo of the, of the what we call 1740 or uh, uh, Building 3 here in, in San Antonio, Universal City. Um, the commercial bank financing in combination with the seller was 100% financing, so it was a a cashless transaction for us. And um, 
over time, the payments uh, you know, on that will actually be less than um, what uh, our lease payments, because the lease contain escalator, uh, escalator clauses in it. So um, a, a great opportunity to acquire this facility at, at below the appraised fair market value and excited to have that uh, moving forward as we move into phase two. Um, could you flip the slide, Danny? On the P and L or income statement, we kind of already hit the hit the high points and in, in the highlights. Um, one area I'll point out for I'm sure there I know there's some astute listeners that we uh, I'm looking for some good questions in the Q and A. Um, when you see the 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 profit uh, before tax for the first time in the history of the group to have a uh, profit before tax, the taxation figure is higher than that. And that relates to the, the jurisdictions where we, we make profit in the United States operations uh, are profitable and have extinguished their net operating loss carry forward. So we pay taxes there when we, when we consolidate as a group uh, the expenses and the activities in the UK, the loss making relating to the startup of the Orthopure XT, um, that's why that profit, uh, the tax figure seems a little uh, off what you, a typical investor might expect. But uh, it, it, so um, next slide, Danny. On the balance sheet, we talked about our cash position supporting our growth plans. Um, we did increase our inventory levels in the in the H1 this year, and um, we talked about our supply uh, supply being a strength. And as we <coughs> added uh, or in the process of adding um, new accounts, um, we ran into some regulatory headwinds, but we decided to um, maintain that inventory, and we'll work down that position over time as these new contracts come online. Um, you know, inventory turnover is a key uh, KPI for us, so it's something we monitor closely, and we'll we'll bring those figures down as we move into these new uh, new contracts over time. Um, related to that, um, last year we disclosed and discussed uh, our we increased our lending facility with Midcap, who is our um, financial partner. We, our revolving line of credit, we increased from 5 million to 10 million. Yeah, we added um, in our, in the H1 in, in association with the uh, refinancing or the purchasing of the building, we increased that from five to 6 million to support that working capital investment. So we're well funded to execute on the future growth plans for the business. Danny? So yeah. Um, so in summary, the um, for the past three and a half years, we've talked about the 4S strategy, and in 2023 we added the uh, growth pillars. But these, uh, the four S's and the growth pillars have been a highly successful uh, change, uh, responsible for that change in the direction for the company, and has and continues to provide a structure and clear direction for everything that we do. With our expanded capacity, our uh, the our, the um, processing efficiencies, the diversity that we have in our products, our our, our ability to be flexible to adjust to market conditions, uh, we have continued to grow the company uh, by 16% in H1 2024, and have continued to demonstrate profitability in the first half of 2024. <clears throat> As we uh, continue to um, um, you know, uh, obtain regulatory approvals. We look to expand our business outside the United States with not only our finished tissue products, but also with unprocessed uh, 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 tissue. As David's just mentioned, uh, we bought the building, which has uh, figures prominently in our future expansion plans. And, by, uh, and we managed to do this in a very capital efficient manner and this enables us to continue our growth plans with our existing cash balance. So our dedicated team uh, continues to remain excited about the future for tissue regenics. And David and I are, of course, very extremely proud to be part of this organization. 
So at this point, I will turn the meeting over to Alessandro and uh, we'll um, turn our cameras back on and then we'll be ready to take some questions. Perfect, Daniel, David, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to read the questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we have received questions throughout today's presentation. If I could hand back to you to read out those questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Very, very good. Thank you, Alessandro. <clears throat> um, so, I'll read them, Danny. For, okay. Um, when does the company hope to be adding some serious value to the shareholders given the fall in share price since 2014? Want me to take the first step? Go ahead. Um, so Danny and I came on really at the beginning of 2021. Um, so what happened prior to that, um, we really can't comment on, um, you know, what we have been focused on since we came on and put in place the, the four S strategies and then, and then built on that with the growth pillars is, is delivering on what we said we're going to do. Um, and I think you've, you know, seen that with these results and, and the, in the six sets of results prior to that. So seven periods of, uh, of growth, um, you know, and we continue to um, grow. When you look at the progress we've made in not only growing the top line, but growing the, the bottom in line, um, adjusted EBITDA uh, profit for the year of 2023, our H1 adjusted EBITDA equal to, or actually greater than the entire year of last year. And these results having a, a positive profit uh, before tax. So um, we're focused on delivering what we said we're going to do. And eventually we believe that will be recognized in the market. Um, next, thank you for taking my question. You have been successful in making numerous applications in different jurisdictions for TRX's products. Some of these applications are fairly dated at this point. Are you anticipating related regulatory decisions, approvals in the near future? Boy, if I could predict the pace of regulatory approvals, I um, <laughs> that that would be fantastic. Uh, it's 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 been it's been challenging, whether in the United States as well as other 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 markets. I mean, we've um, we've just seen delays uh, in the United States, uh, you know, trying to get an export license. Uh, something that used to take three weeks is now it's taking three months. Um, things that we anticipated and were told would take six months in some markets as, and now we've been waiting over a year. So, um, you know, they're moving forward, but they're moving forward at a at a, at a much slower pace. Um, so unfortunately for us, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, we continue to deliver. We make our the adjustments that we need to um, and and uh, obviously focus on the, the, the business opportunities at hand. But then we're still building, of course, business opportunities for uh, for the future. And um, obviously, yeah, I, I wish we could um, you know, have a better idea of when when we can anticipate that, but that's that's just not our realistic. I'm sure we're not the only. We're I'm sure we're not the only company who's um, dealing with those frustrations. Just one example I'll give to build on what what you said, Danny. That there's a certificate that we're required to get from the FDA as we try to enter some of these foreign markets. It used to be like a two week, you know fill out a form on the internet and you get it back in two weeks. And now I think the last one that we tried to get the exact same form was like four months. Yeah, three to four months. Yeah. So. And it's like, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, what was behind the, uh, what was behind the 13% increase in admin costs, which is well ahead of inflation. Um, 
Well, you'd want to go back and you know adjust out for the non-cash items that are caught up in the overheads. Uh, we still show significant operating leverage. Um, obviously, there are price uh, price rises and salary increases, but um, we're very conscious in our managing our budget to um, have sales growth faster than our administra administrative expenses growth. So. Um, Please continue to continue to see that operating leverage in the business in the H1. Uh, why isn't revenue growth larger than it is, given the market size, the quality of existing products, and the development of new products? Um, you know, again, the the results that we just presented were the first half of 2024, and uh, in our D sale business uh, grew by 34 percent. Um, I think that is significantly above market growth, um, and uh, I, you know, I think uh, that's something that uh, we can, uh, you know, proudly uh, talk about. Now, our our our, um, our growth in our our buy rents business. Uh, as you've heard, that the growth with our bone products was was um, was also quite good, you know, in the double digits in the tw mid twenty uh, percent range. Um, but that division uh, was impacted by some of the headwinds that we 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 talked about: uh, regulatory approvals for our our donor tissue, uh, some of the headwinds that we're seeing in the wound care uh, space. So, um, so um, I, I think we are seeing some pretty good growth uh, with uh, a number of our products, but uh, because of the diversification, because of the mix, um, you know, we have, you know, we have, we've, we've encountered uh, some headwinds. Um, our, you know, if you look at the past three years, our, our compound annual growth rate of over 20% is uh, something that, um, is when we compare ourselves to our peers, is uh, is 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 pretty good. Yes, I mean to build on that. I mean, the twelve percent for buyer rents is still double the the growth rate for the bone graft substitute market. So we continue to to take market share, and you know, as we've said, these results you know met the board's expectations, and and so. I think we should be pleased with them. Um, Having said that, it doesn't mean that, yeah, you know, we obviously we'd love to do more and better. So. Oh yeah, it goes we're, without saying. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah we're not. Uh, okay. Uh, with 3.5 million in cash and phase two expansion by 2025, how will you fund it? any plans for capital raising or financing you know we've said since we took this role that we do not anticipate you know raising equity funds to uh do the phase two expansion uh if there is non-dilutive financing that's needed or or required you know we've just shown that we can do that um so we are confident that the, the business is funded to continue to grow in you know in previous meetings we've talked about what our phase two expansion uh looked like you know a lot of those plans were developed uh in the 21 22 uh time frame uh and here it is you know and we've also talked about that these phase two expansion uh plans would be executed in 2025 and completed by the end of 2025. um you know i'm going to say because of the efficiencies that we've developed um, the plans that we had in 21, 22 are going to be different than what we execute on. But just because we don't necessarily need, uh, we, we, you know, we don't need to have that, that, that big a house. Uh, you know, we can do what we need to do in a smaller house now. And so, so uh, that smaller house helps offset some of those uh, the cost increases that we've seen and what it costs to construct, uh, uh, you know, construct a house, construct a you know, clean room. So um, again, uh, we still do not anticipate the need for any, um, um, you know, the need for a, a capital raise, as, as David had already mentioned. Non uh, our cash on hand, non-dilutive financing, uh, will will.
take care of our um, uh, our financing needs for the expansion. Uh, Benjamin H asks in regards to the 2023 H1 cash position being higher than 2024 for the same period. What is that attributable to? Um, really, the the um, as we discussed, we invested in our inventory, um, and we will continue to manage our inventory position um, as we work into these new markets and and trade that down to build back up the the turnover figures um, to the historic averages. Nicholas K asks, at current rates of growth, how many years will the company's facilities, assuming further development on current sites, be able to meet demand? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we've already talked about, you know, more obviously short term, that the phase one expansion uh, carries us through, um, uh, you know, just beyond uh, 20, uh, 2025, um, we have enough revenue uh, potential, um, you know, for that facility to be in the $40 million uh, range. Um, the expansion that we plan to finish in 2025 will give us revenue potential up to uh, the, you know, um, you know, up to about $100 million range. Robin B. asks, thank you for the hard work and progress you have made to date. The period on period growth is showing the rewards of what you are achieving. Following an earlier question, is there a plan to highlight or advertise the upside you were delivering to the wider marketplace to gain further shareholder interest? You know, we're actively engaged with our private investors uh, here on IMC and proactive. Uh, we've got a broker that puts us in front of uh, many institutional investors uh, to try to add to our register. We added, you know, actually now if you flip, uh, if when you look at the, our deck, our largest investor in Thalo was a, was a group that we uh, added, uh, I believe it was at 2022, Danny, right? Um, I think that's about right. So um, we continue to, um, engage with new institutional investors. And I think, you know, the progress we've made with respect to uh, becoming profitable, um, what we did last year with our um, share recapitalization, you know, Danny and I have been in meetings with fund managers and they said, we really like the, the story. We like you guys, but there's no way I, I could put uh, this this investment opportunity at not 0.5 p in front of my uh, board for approval because they would laugh me out of the room. So, you know, we took the step to um, uh, change the share price and, and put it in a range that made it more attractive to institutional investors. And we continue to engage with them to to, to add to the register. Uh, Robin B again asks, the business growth rate being ahead of the market growth is clear, but considering the total size of the market, is there a plan to accelerate this further? <clears throat> yeah, so it, it's, um, yes, yeah, certainly um, it would be nice to, to grow uh, faster. And some, and you know, I, I, when we look at how our business is structured, our commercial side of our business is is we're, we're a hybrid, where we have um, for a lot of our business it's with private label with strategic partners, and so in um, uh, you know we're in some cases relying on their growth to uh, to obviously uh, you know for us to to grow. And then we also have products that are distributed on our own direct, our, our D-cell products, the Orthopure XT. These are all products that, that, that we have um, more control of. So, um, so, you know, we will continue our efforts to try to grow this business as, as, as quickly, uh, as aggressively uh, as we can. 
Uh, obviously, we're very conscious of uh, our, our ability to provide enough uh, supply, but that's certainly uh, always uh, an, an objective uh, for us to, um, you know, to to grow this business as as quickly as we can. Dave. Nicholas K asks, uh, the corporate website is clearly not a priority. Will you be working to keep it up to date and relevant as a marketing tool for the company? Well, yeah, certainly, um, yeah, our, our website uh, uh, could use uh, so, some upgrades. And you're and you're right; it's not a priority for the organization. Again, most of our uh, we don't rely. Uh, we haven't had to rely really on our, our website on to generate new uh, biz, business. Obviously, with ex existing customers is easy, but uh, generate business with new customers. Uh, um, we've been very fortunate where people, um, if there are new strategic partners, they they've come to us. So, uh, but to your point, uh, for the for for general uh, uh, awareness about the the the, the company to attract new shareholders, um, uh, the opportunity to upgrade the website is something that uh, we will uh, certainly um, uh, uh, consider. Dave? Well, yeah, I mean, to build on that, we do have um, some significant updates that are coming through um, very soon to the website. Uh, so in, say in the next couple of weeks, there will be some updates to our strategy and, and some of the key aspects of the business that have been updated. Um, in certain areas, we're highly regulated as to what we can say, you know, and the regulators actively review companies' websites. So we have to be very circumspect about um, any text that goes on the website because that can um, that is a, a matter of scrutiny from the from the regulators. But there will be updates to the website here um, in the in the near in the near future. Uh, William D. asks, do you have any plans or ambitions for acquisitions or further strategic product processing or geographic expansion beyond those discussed today? Um, <clears throat> uh, let's, I'll take the second half, which is strategic product processing or geographic expansion. So ge geographic expansion, yes. Um, we have... Um, we have actively right now uh, a number of regulatory approvals that we're waiting on to expand our our, uh, our global, uh, you know, as part of our global expansion plans. So those are on ongoing, and uh, as they uh, are approved, uh, as we initiate uh, some sales, uh, that's potentially opportunities for us to disclose that uh, in the in the marketplace. Um, further strategic product processing, yeah, obviously I can't really d discuss that, but those are always um, opportunities uh, for us to continue to grow the business. And then when it comes to plans or ambitions for acquisitions, uh, it is something that we uh, we do look at. Uh, we have some pretty um, strict criteria uh, as to what um, what would make sense for the organization. Um, you know, we're very mindful of that. Um, anything that we would do or look at would have to make sense for the organization from, from a commercial viewpoint, from a financial viewpoint, uh, from a regulatory viewpoint. Uh, Colin V asks, as a UK investor, I see what appears to be opportunistic litigation in the United States against pharma device companies, which have serious consequences for the company. How do you assess this risk for TRX? I think he's making a more broad claim about, you know, uh, plaintiff's lawyers in the United States. I don't, we're, you know, um, not aware of any pending or actual litigation against our company. Uh, we maintain um, insurance policies to protect against those risks. Um, and we've got a 
um, you know, a whole risk protocol that is reviewed regularly. And we discuss in our annual report how we manage the risks that our business face. Yeah, certainly the business that we're in um, with biologic products made from human tissue as well as animal tissue, you know, there have been, uh, you know, there, there, you know, there was uh, rec recently in the last uh, two years, a uh, company that uh, produced human allograph, uh, a human allograph tissue product, which, uh, uh, which managed to transmit uh, uh, some disease. Um, yeah, that that was certainly, you know, very very unfortunate for, uh, for for the patients. Um, of course, that opened up that that particular company to uh, litigation. Um, that product that um, that kind of was the source of it was a higher risk uh, product. It was not a terminally sterilized product. Um, all the products that. T tissue regenics produces are terminally sterilized. So, uh, so you know we, you know we again we kind of just uh, just like that previous question about um, looking at um, new opportunities to develop products, looking at uh, any acquisitions, um, it has to make sense to the organization. And again, we're uh, we're you know we're not going to do things that put the company at risk. Yeah, just to build on that quickly, uh, when when Danny says terminal sterilization, it, he and I know exactly what that means. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I apologize. The um, what that allows us, we have to go through a very extensive uh, validation of the process, and then it, the product is exposed to some kind of ionizing radiation, and at the end of that, the statistic statistics allow us to say there's a one in a million chance that the product could uh, uh, could uh, not be sterile. And these products that cause the problems that Danny were talking about didn't go through that terminal sterilization process. They went through a very clean manufacturing process, but not that final terminal step. So yeah, we're very aware of the risks and, and conscious of what we do. Perfect. Daniel, David, I'd just like to thank you for answering those questions from investors. Of course, the company can review the questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you both. Daniel, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Well, again, thank you, everyone, for your for your time today. I uh, hope you uh, uh, got an, uh, a good update on the organization and a good a view of uh, how we will continue to keep uh, the tissue regenics group on its positive trajectory from revenue uh, as well as uh, profitability. Thank you very much. Thank Daniel, you. Daniel, David, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete. I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Tissue Regenics Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.